Okay, so we're just going to get started <clears throat> in the interest of time. My name is Jessica Arendt. I have been in the industry since 2015, the end of that year. I have specialized in manufacturing, private label, and white label. Um, I, here comes Luna. <laughs> um, I, I've specialized in white label and private label um, throughout my career, and my focus has always been on compliance. I am the new addition to BH Private Label, soon to be known as Blumios. We're based out of Daytona, Florida. I'm the Human Resources Director there, as well as I am probably known to most as the Compliance Officer for an organic brand, artisanal brand, as a matter of fact, that is USDA organic called Cannabidiol Life. I have um, an exceptional panel here today to discuss this topic, private and white labeling. Um, each one of these panelists comes from a unique background in this industry from all over the country. I'm going to allow each panelist 90 seconds to self-hype, shameless self-promotion, tell you who they are, where they come from, why they're in the industry, and then we'll move forward with the questions. Hi, y'all. My name is Luna Stauer. I'm born and raised in the Bay Area in California. I've been in the regulated cannabis space and one of the founding members of Jetty Extracts, which was um, one of the first to market with vape pens in California back in 2013. I'm now the Vice President of Business Development for iSpire. Um, you guys might know Aspire. We're uh, the, the leader in e-cig space, but now we're in the cannabis space. So we work in particularly in cannabinoids like D8, D9, and CBD. Um, I have a master's in teaching and my whole background is around advocacy and um, activism around access to this plant social justice, um, and really have worked hard on equity initiatives in this space as well, really uh, heavy in the psychedelic space as well, just really about access for this plant. Um, I don't really have a business background, but because I love it so much, I just naturally fell into this, and so I'm really happy to be here and stoked to talk with all of you today. Go ahead, Rocco. Good morning, everyone. My name is Rocco Iannapolo. I am the Director of Business Development for Cannabis Kitchen Supplies and we provide ancillary equipment to the industry. Um, you can think of us as the U-line or the Granger of the industry. We try to provide all of the commercial equipment and supplies that our customers need. I got into the industry uh, about eight years ago. I left corporate America to pursue my passion for the plant. And uh, long story short, I, I've played around in a couple different areas around compliance and cultivation, but finally found my home in the uh, supply chain area of the industry. And um, basically, uh, we uh, are a, a national company based out of Boulder and uh, uh, have relationships with a number of different uh, partners throughout the industry uh, through a group called the Canna Consortium. So that's another thing you may hear mentioned uh, today, which is a, a referral network. And um, I think that's uh, about it for me. Uh, so my name is David Hyde. I worked for about two years with uh, Extract Labs and Namaji. So Extract Labs, the supercritical CO2 uh, extractors, and Namaji was a hemp processing facility. So I was there at the start of uh, the launch of the brand of Holis, which was their initial white label. I currently work for uh, Phytophile. I do consulting for them. So that's a PhD chemist who offers formulations out of uh, Long Beach in California. Uh, that's all locally sourced hemp there. Um, Basically, I, I started out actually growing in Austria and doing a little bit of cloning. That was back in 2011. So I've been in this space for about 10 years now, both privately and you know for business. Um, I absolutely love this industry and welcome any sort of uh, contacts or networking opportunities. So. Hello, my name is Elise Gordon-Holtz and I'm a manufacturer of infused products. I've had one of the first edibles kitchens in Colorado since 09, both medical and recreational licenses. And so we basically did start what was going on that now is the forwarding of everything that's happening that we want to continue with education. Um, just moved out of the edible side um, in 19 to do education, to do hemp flour, doing distribution, doing retail, doing wholesale, doing educating, doing connecting with people that need 
to get the experience to not double up on how to do everything, really not to reinvent the wheel. I've been in hemp since 2012. Um, I have a real estate background, so I have even pulled that into the mix. And we have white labeled, so I appreciate being asked to be on a panel for white labeling and hope to give you some good information today. Thank you so much. When we began in this industry, <clears throat> it was all about labels coming out of cottage industry environments, and very few manufacturers were, in fact, true and real laboratory environments. Today, all of that has changed as we see the engagement of the FDA and the FTC, and we're driven to produce brands that are professionally done in professionally charged facilities. What are the key factors we should consider when embarking on the selection journey with a product partner? And what are MOQs and how does that work? Luna? It's, hit it. Is anyone called to speak to that? No. I can talk. Go ahead. Sure. To answer your last question first, MOQs, those are minimum order quantities, and that can certainly be problematic for new business starting up. Uh, to be able to get competitive pricing for the packaging or whatever it is that you're purchasing, um, it, it is difficult sometimes to meet those MOQs. And so you're uh, either in a situation where you have long lead times, or you're paying high prices or both, um, if you're not able to satisfy those requirements. Um, some of the other things I'll mention in terms of uh, as you're developing your, your supply chain, um, which MOQs plays into is, um, understanding a few other things that are important from a business perspective. So um, I, I, we talked about lead time. So understanding the timing on things, there's often some miscommunications that can happen around when you expect something versus when the supplier is going to get it to you. So these types of things can certainly disrupt your, your operations. So you want to be you know, very clear with your partners that you're working with about what you expect and when you expect it, and that goes both ways. Uh, so having very clear time-bound communications. Um, well, and also just MOQs are minimum order quantities for those of you who don't know. I noticed that we didn't define that term. Yep. Um, and then we'll probably get into this uh, further, but uh, understanding where you're getting your products from and having communications around uh, any incidents that might happen in the case of the recall. I know I'm getting a little ahead of myself here, Jessica, but uh, I do want to mention uh, in terms of uh, talking about recall procedures, uh, you'll want to make sure that as you're sourcing ingredients uh, for your operations that you have a, a discussion with that uh, about that topic with your suppliers uh, so that uh, there's an understanding that if there is an issue, um, what, what happens next and how you communicate down the line uh, when you have a recall situation. I mean, for me, I feel like MOQs is really specific to what your cost of goods and what your operating costs are and how much money you have to burn. If, if, if it's, for example, for us, if in order to buy cartridges, uh, if you're an oil manufacturer and you buy hardware from us, we have a minimum order quantity of 500 units. That's obviously an arbitrary number. We'll go below. But if we, go, if we drop below, we do it with the promise that you're going to get a bigger order the next time or that we're investing into a long-term relationship. There, the, the negotiation power that you have around it really is an opportunity, you know, like Rocco said, to like learn about who you're working with, how you're working together, and also to explain, like in our case, we're ordering it from China, right? So it's got like lead time is a huge thing. Customs is another thing. So as we're thinking about our cost of goods and our business plan, really MOQs is something that obviously you want it to be a business driver. Literally, from my understanding of it, is it's what is what's worth my time and you know what's scalable. It's economics of scale, you know. So I think that that's the most important thing is just to know where what your margins are, where you can move with that. Because people who you break MOQ for are really loyal and they really appreciate it, especially in our space. A lot of these cannabis companies are really small. They're not well-funded. They're not able to bank. Like they don't have liquid assets like that. Cash flow is an issue for them. So for us, a lot of times we err on the side because we are well, really well-funded. We have the privilege of doing this. We are on the side of the customer service where we kind of give folks what they want with the understanding that we're kind of a startup. We're investing in new relationships, but it's definitely mm -hmm. ideal to get that MOQ for revenue, but not every decision is always revenue driven depending on the type of company that you're running. Yeah, I'm going to add to that. Um, 
the key is this industry is driven with heavy money and you've got to have it and you've got to be able to put it in the right places because you can burn through it so quickly because rules will change. White labeling gives you the advantage of making a relationship with someone whose product you believe in, who can work with you because you're possibly a small animal just getting started so that minimums are really big important and how can you move that minimum to scale up for your dollars so you don't feel like you're doing everything on your own where they can direct you, where they can guide you through your packaging. But it's not inexpensive to hire an in-house formula. And quite honestly, if you look at Estee Lauder, L'Oreal, those guys actually, a good majority of them have a lot of products that they all white label the same and then add their special little touch that just changes it, their essential oil, their packaging, whatever it is. So that is why it becomes a benefit, but you have to decide what is important and absolutely that your white labeling company is listening to what you want to make that connection and all the ingredients that they're putting in that you like or you want to adjust and take out that they're listening. And the minimum starting is the hardest part. And if they're willing to give you a low level going in, you can grow and they're hoping you will so that they can ramp up on other products you may do. Um, I'd like to just add on top of uh, the lead times. Oh, Speak really close to the mic. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, uh, to just add on top of uh, the lead times, I think it's important if you are really just starting out to vet. A lot of these white label manufacturers, um, there, there are unscrupulous people, and this is kind of like measure uh, twice, cut once. Uh, you really want to make sure that you're getting into a partnership with a good, reputable company. Um, what their claims are and what the lead times are that they claim you can actually, in most cases, you can tour the facilities, you can see what equipment they're working with, you can research that equipment, and you can get a feel for if they're telling you kind of the truth, if they're going to be able to meet these lead times. You can, in some cases, you can talk to other customers and get a feel for what their experience was working with them. Um, my background is a lot more from uh, split contracts, so from farmers that want to have a toll processing done. So if anyone has more questions, more directed on that afterwards, you can feel free to uh, direct those at me. You know, that's a great uh, point, I, David. I do want to just echo the due diligence that you do. Getting referrals from others that are using that white labeler is extremely helpful. And don't just get one, maybe try and get two or three. Yeah, look at several. And you can ask a company if they white label. You, They may not even realize they can have the ability to do it. and they're being asked really frequently. So now it's a new arena for them. You've been very pleased with their product. Maybe it's even something you can partner up with them a little bit so it cuts some of your costs because you always have to feel there's a need for cutting costs because the industry knows how to add the costs very easily. <laughs> and you have to pivot all the time. It is pivot, pivot. So you don't want to maybe even be locked into one company that's white labeling for you, depending on what you're doing and what's their specialty. Right. Okay, so we've spent a lot of time on a question and I'm gonna need to push this forward so that we answer and get to the point. So if we can condense this, that'd be great. Um, we only have about 15 minutes left. Um, so we often hear organic, vegan, kosher, and natural in the production of can cannabinoid products. Labels are branded with icons that signify to the consumer that the products have met those icons, that have met those standards. How do we, we generally speaking, I want my own private label, how would I go about guaranteeing or, or validating and verifying that that facility or that private label partner has the certifications in order for me to claim them and can I always claim them if the manufacturer has them? David? So I'm, it's good to have a legal counsel. Uh, most of the contractors that you're gonna work with have in-house legal counsel, but they are working for these companies. And the, the onus is kind of on you to make sure that you are uh, just kind of uh, following the, the FDA's regulations and how you're labeling your, your products. So like, uh, I know that the FDA did send out some notices to stop labeling certain things as dietary supplements and stuff like that. You don't want to get caught on the wrong side of that. As far as kosher and vegan, 
uh, it's pretty easy to check the ingredients of what you're purchasing and seeing if they fit those, those are, uh, same with organic too, if it's fitting that, if it's using pesticides or something, it's obviously not organic. You might need to do a third check though, because sometimes you can edit PDFs from labs and stuff like that. So get all of their PDFs of all their stuff and then call and actually confirm the, the if you COV, really want to do due diligence. Those certificates of, of analysis yeah. are very important because it is easy to fake them. They do circulate. And this again goes back to vetting the company, making sure that you are working with a reputable supplier and that they have a good track record. Usually if there's like a PhD involved, they're, they're doing things properly. And then the only one that's not on here would be good manufacturing processes. And I think that's something you'll see more and more as this industry kind of evolves is that people will adhere to standard SOPs and you know the, the quality of the products will become more consistent. And yeah, and you can even ask to see their SOPs. Yeah. Yep. So I'd like to dive one step deeper. We're gonna get questions. I want to dive one step deeper into this because I'm going to pull on Elisa's experience from a brand perspective. The certificate of analysis, which is a hot, hot topic, right? And we continue to return back to the certificate of analysis. So uh, can you expound on your experience with that certificate of analysis and its verification or validation um, in your own experiences? Yes, and I hate to say that it's still got a long way to go. Testing is probably going to be the most important equation of everything that's going on. And being an edibles company and these testing companies were asked to basically test stuff they had really no idea and did not have the equipment. I can take in something from the same batch that's completely homogeneity and get 15 results and the lab wants to pass it off as where did you test all the dissolute that you had coming in? So we're still having issues. We're still having pesticide tracking issues. My goal was to always get as close to the rule rights as you can, but unfortunately, even with COAs on products, we're still at a place where if a guy hands it off to you, it's very hard to match it to a flower or it's laying on a counter and now there's four of them there. And so we, we have to keep striving for the GMP, for the testing, for the enforcement, more importantly, because they can put all the rules in play and without straying, you've got rules right now on Delta 8 going like that and you either don't care because there's no enforcement, so you keep going because it will change. And that's what you have to remember is how do you keep pivoting without a lot of expense? It is so important to have your COAs because it does show proof. Every time you can be in a rule box that USDA puts out, the agriculture, the health department, any division that they will let you be in, get it because it strengthens your story. Make sure your guys are legit. You do know where their tests come from. You do know where, what's the story with your lab? I'm going to push you. I'm going to give you a gram of the product I'm going to use to make my product so you don't excuse it to, we didn't test it. We don't even know it was good when you got their COA. So we have to be better on policing. Excellent. Thank you. As we produce new brands and they land on shelves of major retailers, the competition stiffens the presentation of marketing. Moreover, the requirements for the brands on the shelves are more restringent regulations. The FDA is stepping in now as an example. We're seeing the products on every conceivable shelf from our Ulta beauty brand shelves to TJ Maxx on the overruns, all the way down the channel into the convenience stores. Now we fall over to the QR code and the requirement of having a QR code on a label. I question manufacturing facilities and the implied ramifications for failed QR codes, failed testing, and the inability to match potency to product. Does anybody want to expand on that? I do have a cool little anecdote. If anyone knows Kiva Confection, they're the number one edibles brand in California. They started back in the day. They kept spiking for pesticides and they were wondering why they had chocolate covered blueberries. And it turned out that the organic Driscoll's or whatever bl blueberries, when they separated from the hash, the hash was clean. It was the blueberries that were spiking. So we have, we have more stringent on our cannabis than Absolutely. we do even on our organic food yeah. that we're feeding our kids. So I just wanted to put that out there. 
but someone else can take it. I totally agree with you, and I find that's what's so interesting. Cannabis has been scrutinized for every pesticide and everything in our food chain. They won't even tell you what you're eating, and it's causing cancers and all these things. And this is one of my questions that they still haven't fully answered. You white label in a GMP kitchen but you took it out of the GMP kitchen in bulk, and now you're labeling it in your facility that's not GMP. Did you break the chain? I sort of think you did, but I don't even think some of the GMP companies think they broke the chain. We were on QR codes way back in cannabis because on the marijuana side, because we had to be. We did break all those barriers. It goes back to who's enforcing again because you need the same barriers. And your barrier is against all the people who want to do it wrong. And you're right, the fruits and the things that go into it are probably the contaminants and not necessarily being tracked back to the edible because when I use someone's dissolute or I use his flower, He's the grower. I didn't make the dissolute. I'm not an extractor for that. Then maybe I'm guilty. So when they tell me I didn't pass a test because of a pesticide, well, it wasn't in my flour or my butter probably. So that's why there has to be more on task of how's that chain going to the consumer who is ingesting and what's good and what's bad. Excellent. You know, something that uh, David had mentioned earlier about getting legal counsel, it's not necessarily legal counsel, but um, professional help um, in terms of assisting you with documenting your entire supply chain. So all of what we're talking about here is being able to go back to the source. And if you don't have that paper trail ahead of time, you're going to find yourself in a situation where you may have to destroy more product because you can't prove that it was only this batch or that batch. So um, what I would say is, you know, make sure you're surrounding yourselves with experts if you don't know. And, and uh, let's be honest, when you go into this business, there's a lot of stuff you have to learn. You can't know it all. So making sure you have the relationships with legal counsel or um, compliance auditing firms or whomever it is um, to help you make sure that you have all of that stuff in order. Because once you get called to task, it's going to be too late. If you don't already have it, you're going to be... And the advantage that the hemp side has that the marijuana side didn't have is because we started it, we didn't have the go-to people. Now, part of your accounting, your lawyer, and a 10-year veteran. Why reinvent the wheel when you can get a lot of information that has to happen, is going to happen? It's transferable information depending on how they mold it. But you need the rules, you'll need the guidelines, you'll need the labs, you'll need the suppliers, you'll need all of that, you'll need the sourcing. It's happened, so embrace it. Put them on your team, pick one. So really, and I'm gonna veer from my regularly scheduled questions, um, really, now we're stepping into something called chain of custody, and chain of custody is now a new big buzz conversation. And in the new facility where I now am, I hear it every day, six times a day. Who's got the chain of custody? Who's got the chain of custody? We have to have the chain of custody. It's got to be the chain of custody. It's in quarantine. Okay. Can David expand on what is the chain of custody? How does it work? So chain of custody is going to be uh, basically who's holding the product and who's responsible for it at a time. Uh, if it's a larger, like, full vertical facility, there will be seed to sale tracking software so you know which batch is in which room and which person is handling it, which person had access to it, all while it's going through this. So again, when you're, when you're picking a, a supplier, you want to work with someone who has all these tools already implemented. Um, and that, that comes down to just batch tracking. Do they have a basic batch tracking software? Um, it, as far as when it's in transit and things like that, again, I, I worked mostly with toll processors. So uh, the growers were often, the, the legal responsibility was on them to transport it, to bring it to the facility. Then once it was in our care, we had it under certain storage. Um, you know, you want to know certain things about the, the raw material when it's coming in. You want to know if there's pesticides that need to be remediated. Further down the line, you want to know if those batches that you're getting were remediated, if there was certain things that had happened to it. The software kind of allows you to see it along each step of the way, what happened to it. And as the industry grows and as these things are more internalized in these companies, you'll, you'll start to see 
that the, the chain of custody will just, uh, it'll less be a, a legal problem, it'll be more like a, like a pharmacy or something like that when they're, they're bringing it out. And, Guess, yeah, there's nothing worse system. for business than a than a contract dispute. So get ahead of it. That would be my biggest point. It's definitely get ahead of these things. Get the SOPs down. Get all this stuff in writing so that what he's talking about, all of these iterative potentials of if this, then this, like of the remediation and who goes with what, where, and every facility has a different license and different jurisdictions or different um, you know localities have their own laws around that. There's also federal agents, state agents, highway patrol, local police, sheriffs. These, you know, the CDPH and, you know, all these different health and public health organizations, everyone's got their own sort of setup. So having this, you know, this goes back to that due diligence around making sure that these people are right and tight and that you're dealing with people who have, who are, have visible SOPs that they're willing to share with you. Have an in-house counsel that's going to be able to already have a prefab contract that's going to outline these things. Or if they don't, you better have the ability to carry that weight for them or whatever. But I think that the more you can build this ahead of time and get ahead of these issues, because not only is it bad for business, but now you've ru potentially ruined a relationship over something that would have just been fine if it was just been in writing. Yeah, it comes down to like a good faith argument if you yes. do go to court. And did you take all of these precautions? Were you compliant? And you know, you, you can look at established industries and get a feel. If you're selling you know, a CBD to someone under 21 or under 18, or you're in these gas stations and stuff, your product could be the one that's you know, on the news the next day as being ingested by a kid or something right. like that. And that's something you really want to avoid. So again, it comes down to vetting who you're working with. So this takes us to the recall. Anybody ever had their car recalled? Um, so I faced a recall situation for the first time in my experience in the industry and in manufacturing. I did manufacturing before this industry. And it wrapped around the idea that we may have had too much lead in an edible product that exceeded the maximum allowable allowance, allowable allowance. Um, so the reason chain of custody now becomes important is because we've moved into a world of recalls. It's on retail shelves. And somebody gets sick for whatever reason, the contamination comes up through the lab that's been done third party by the retailer, and all eyes and noses and fingers point back to brand owner, okay? So chain of custody, recall, this is where we're moving. How are recalls done? What should the manufacturer have and be prepared for to provide to and to whom? Can anybody answer this? I will talk on them a little bit. Um, they're bad and you don't want to have one, but it can be something really simple. It's not always something that's horrible. So it could be water levels because if they're not at the right thing on probably something that's ingestible it could create a spore of bacteria um, i think some of the way to simplify the combination of the chain of custody and the recall is a car has a vin number and they know where every single screw and piece and everything and where it's gone so that when they have to come back on an accident it's sort of the same setup. So the manufacturer made it possibly for another company. So you have to make sure you have a really good attorney because you might have to just be protecting the fact that you didn't do anything to make it, but you're in that chain of recall because everybody touched the situation. The guy at Whole Foods who has it on his shelf might get called into it because he put it there even though he didn't make it. So all that chain and the recall, and a recall can be just for protection, and again, it might be the blueberry, and it wasn't the cannabis that was used. So what, what created it? How can you protect it so that your product doesn't get recalled, and then how do you introduce it back into the marketplace once you have it by correcting the issue? I can tell you one of the more common recalls that you can run into, uh, especially in Wisconsin right now, where THC Delta 9 is still very much illegal. Um, if your product happens to be ingested by a child or something like that and local law enforcement gets involved, uh, they will come in and start undercover purchasing product from your shop and they will start testing it. If it's above that 0.3% or in Wisconsin, they increased if it's coming from a certain seed in a certain farm that's certified, 1% uh, THC Delta 9. If it's above that, you can actually get into trouble with drug manufacturing, multiple felonies. Uh, according to the hemp pilot, 
these laws that, you know, the DEA, they're not going to spar with you over the wording of any of these laws or the farm bill, they're going to kick in your door and take you to jail. Um, however, the way that it's supposed to work with re recalls is once the product is tested and found to be contaminated or if the THC level is too high, they're supposed to notify the person selling it who's supposed to notify the manufacturer, they're supposed to have time to take it off of their shelves. However, in the real world, what happens is the cops come in, they raid these smaller shops, they destroy product that's not related to the raid. And, you know, that's kind of where a lot of these startup shops that don't have, you know, the proper backing and the proper legal fees, they, they find themselves in these situations as a result of these THC recalls. So, um, you know, it's it, there's no oversight, there's no regulatory body really in most of these states. So, again, it, it's really up to you to kind of protect yourself and to... Um, just, you know, make we sure transport that flour, and we have the paperwork that has been allowable by USDA and the hemp okay paper and all this, but you can hit Kansas, and in their mind, it's weed, and you've got to go through the hoops to defend yourself. I've had it, it's been twice, and they don't care. They're going to take it in. They're going to test it. So, you know, you've got to be really sure of your limits, but paperwork is paramount mm -hmm. because not everybody's on the same page. Mm -hmm. And definitely when you cross state lines, everyone's not on the same and, page. Yeah. Whether and that's when product, that third party check, remember we said to actually call and double, that's when it really yes. comes in handy. Right. Record, you know, so you record. have to just really be aware of all these situations. And again, when you bring it back to white labeling, if that guy's got more certifications, he's helping you out. You're not going, but what if, do we need this? Do we have to do that? Make that relationship, make that one work because you can concentrate on other things to build your business while you're working on really cool looking packaging. Yeah, Lise, you talked about paperwork and uh, Luna, you talked about SOPs. One of the things that I would encourage new business owners to pay attention to is having SOPs. Um, the industry is not unlike a lot of the others where there's a pretty high turnover rate. So even though you may have everything figured out in terms of the way your operation mm -hmm. is running, if you don't have it documented and somebody new comes in and they don't understand what the procedures are, you, you are at risk of something, even though you had everything um, going smoothly, one one new person in there misses one step. You didn't have the documentation right. to to show what your your standard operating procedures are when that recall comes and in. And you're very fortunate because there's a lot of really good compliance companies out right now that are doing THC, that are doing CBD and hemp products, that are moving into the psychedelic side. So again, a relationship that that makes you the top of the mark because. Even if a small guy can't be Morris Tobacco, at the end of the day, if they can buy you because you're top of the mark for a small guy, you've made success. So every time you have an opportunity to ante up on levels of paperwork, compliance, testing, do it. Awesome. At this point, we're out of time on the panel side. I'm going to open it up to questions. There's a mic stand right here if you want to come to the mic. Mr. Hybrid Confections, you had a question, I thought. Actually, folks, I'll be glad to bring them to you. Oh, nice. I did have a question when you guys were talking about um, if you're buying from a company, how do you know if you can put your can you hold it to on you? there? Sorry if you can't hear me. I had a question you guys were talking about. If you're buying from a white label company, uh, how do you know if you can put like an organic label on there? And you guys were talking about uh, different things you can look at their ingredients or stuff. But to my understanding, doesn't that manufacturer have to be um, certified by a certifying body as an organic facility before mm -hmm. you can put that on a, a, a retail label? Yeah, so certified GMP is something that... Uh for instance, Namaji has certified GMP. They're also certified organic. Those are processes that you go through with the USDA. You get that certification, and basically someone's going to come out and look at the facility. That's, again, why if you have the means to do it before you enter in a contract, it is nice to tour the facility to get in front of the people, get a feel for the staff and what equipment they're using. Um, how clean an environment is is a pretty good indicator. You know, it's the same thing when they say go look at the bathrooms or something. You can get a feel of the culture. Um, but, yeah, those things are... As far as like vegan and like uh, kosher, those are very basic guidelines. You can tell if something's vegan just by what the ingredients are. As to whether or not they're actually using that, that comes down to like a gut feeling that you're going to have. 
because no one's going in there and saying, are you doing this this way yet? And at some point, I do. that's... So yeah. <laughs> some people are, you know, they're, they're more accountable and conscientious than others. That's the way the, the industry is. It's definitely a red flag if they will not let you tour the facility. That, Thank yeah. you. I, I love the amount of scrutiny you guys are uh, pushing toward what you should be looking into if you're going to get into a, a white label partnership. Because um, I know that if you're going to be selling a product as your own label, you really got to make sure that you know the you know how the product was made and that it was safe. And if you're letting someone else do that, you really got to check your bases and make sure you knew that it was safe. Well, and because like you know what, you're paying liability insurance on it too because mm -hmm. you're in that chain. And the more your manufacturer can be squared away, and it goes back to the same thing. When you have product that you're making or you want them to make for you, you bring your packaging to their facility mm -hmm. so you didn't break the chain. Then there's no gray. There's no question. It, it just is a much easier transition. And your lab tests, everything's in line because someone can still mess with you, but you can go back because they're going to have to prove USDA health department, state guidelines, or whatever. So, And then your gut has to tell you it feels good and you like their product. And it can also be brand death. It can mean, you know, if you attach yourself to someone who's acting irresponsibly, and like, for example, we're hardware, right? So if we are white label, or, you know, we're filling with an oil filler to give out as promotional samples, let's say I hand you my hardware with a filler, I need to, know, like, I go to their facility. We know where they're growing from. We know exactly what's in it. We know the terpene blends because that's, you know, iSpire's name is attached to that. So we're not going to work with anyone that's not going to make us look really good. Right. So, you know, from her perspective, it's literally like, you're, you know, your liability insurance and all of these things. But for me, from like, I always think marketing and branding because really the biggest thing that we have is IP in the space is our brand, right? Like you're saying, right. you're trying to exit yeah. or something. Mm -hmm. um, and, and a lot of consumers don't know the difference, but the thing is most of bread and butter is in B2B and B2B in this space is very small. If you have a bad reputation, no one will work with you. Yeah. So it's one of those things that you got to watch not only for the, for the quantitative reasons, but these more ethereal qualitative of who do you want to be associated with? Thank you. I hope this comes with a peace of mind uh, that you guys know I work for a, a white label CBD gummy. Company. We'll do any kind of hemp product, but a hemp gummy company. And we try to, what you guys are describing is how we did the backbone of our company. We are a GMP certified a facility. We have an SQF program. We have our first organic audit at the end of this month through CCOF. We also okay. are uh, kosher certified. Um, we are registered with the FDA and the CDPHE. And if you get a gummy from us, it's going to come with a COA that has potency analysis, microbials, heavy metals, pesticides, uh, residual solvents, Applauding. and moxitoxins. Applauding. So, nice. Awesome. Yeah, Thank you. We're, we're doing it from this side, too. Are there any That's other great. questions? just have a quick question. I have a, I'm very new in the CBD space and I'm opening a retail store in New Jersey. And um, I'm working with an attorney now for the commercial side of it and background check on what he needs from me. But do you have a suggestion on who, you, like this is a little overwhelming to me, to who to trust and, and doing your background check. Do you suggest having, a, is there a certain, another person that I'm missing that should be in the preliminary stages with me besides an attorney on on that end. Does that make sense? It does make sense. And it goes back to, you need a veteran who recognizes, you know, it, the situation doesn't change from state to state. When you talk about the players, that may change, but a veteran can give you a recognition or a red flag or what you shouldn't do. And um, that becomes very important because especially in a state where they're just ramping up, you want your dollars to go where they're going to help you advance, not where you're just putting a match to them. And that's so easy to do. Um, if you're doing products, talk to the companies that you're taking or ingesting or topicals that you like and build on what are they doing and how some of them could lead you into There's a lot of cool business networking groups on Facebook. Um, there's a lot of women supporting women you can hit me up to. But also, like, I just say this to everyone. I mean, I would come from the consulting space too, the veteran mm -hmm. piece. If you, if you don't have built into your business plan a strong consulting firm or in-house something, your business plan is not viable because the little, the, 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 the 100K that you put into the infrastructure or maybe more depending on the size of your business, or it could be less. I mean, I'm just, 
it could save you millions of dollars in oopsies later. And, and the pain of it's hard. It, the pain of a startup's always going to be bad. So might as well just chunk everything in. You know, it's like why people have babies all at the same time, like raise them all at the same time. And, but like t the heartbreak of being gears into something where you have an entire team of people and people's hopes and dreams and you brought your family into investing in your company and then things screw up because you didn't do what he did was bake into the DNA be like the nerd, be like the super square nerd, the not fun part of cannabis, the not sexy part of cannabis, the contracts, mm -hmm. that's where the sex is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you the know? SOPs, which are the standard operating procedures, that's what that stands for. Blend it with your business plan. Do baby steps, really important. Not anything's a rush. Mm -hmm. Really analyze it because it can eat you up very, very fast. Mm -hmm. And... I mean, we manufactured for big people that are in the industry right now, and they didn't know how to do anything, and we had to educate them because they had a name, but we knew how to make it. And so you want to get that blend, and our shortcoming was we could do everything. That was our biggest shortcoming because we didn't, so we were in 12 lanes, and if I had anything to suggest... Find a leader for each of your lanes and sink a lot into your marketing and your branding. And then make sure you've got people running those lanes because you won't run it enough to scale it up because it's, it, it's too much. It's overwhelming. That makes so sense. Thank you. You're actually sitting today and tomorrow in a house full of industry professionals and leaders. This panel, the next panel, the next two days of panels. Lock on to each and every one, collect the business cards, go to LinkedIn, do the research, find them online, research, research, research. Amen. And then lock on to the ones that have a clean reputation because they're out there. Thank you. I'd like to add to that in terms of just generally expanding your network. Um, but one of the things I would tell you in this industry, um, what I have observed is you know, you, you think about your competitors, right? Well, the truth is, in most cases, you can have relationships with them and they will be happy to share, other than IP, of course, but, you know, everybody here has a stake in the game. Yes. Um, if one person makes a big mistake, it looks bad for all of us. Yeah. So I have found the general attitude that folks will be happy to share their lessons learned, just like we are here today with people to help them be successful and not have those oopsies. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. Beautiful. That's it for this panel. Thank you so much for sitting in. We appreciate your time and your attention. If you'd like to speak to any of the panelists, they'll be available afterwards. Please get their information and lock on. Good job.